गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन आई थिंक आई एम ऑडिबल टू एवरी वन माई वॉइस इज ऑडिबल यस यस थैंक यू सर थैंक यू तो ओम भूर्भुव स्व तत्सवितुर्वरेण्यम भर्गो देवस्य धीमहि दियो यो नाह प्रचोदया वी आर वेरी ऑनर्ड दैट टुडे प्रोफेसर रिंटू बनर्जी प्रोफेसर ऑफ डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ एग्रीकल्चर एंड फूड इंजीनियरिंग फ्रॉम आई आई टी खड़गपुर इज विद इज गोइंग टू प्रेजेंट टू टॉक्स टूडे फर्स्ट टॉक इज ऑन टू जी इथेनॉल प्रोडक्शन एंड सेकेंड टॉक इट इज फ्रॉम ट्वेल्व इट विल बी ऑन द बायोडीजल सो लेट मी इंट्रोड्यूस प्रोफेसर बनर्जी फर्स्ट देन वील स्टार्ट द सेशन professor uh, rintu banerji head agriculture and food engineering department and center for rural development and innovative sustainable technology ex mnre chair professor is acknowledged as one of the leading uh, enzy- enzymologist working in the area of food fermentation and bioenergy she has completed her phd from biotechnology unit chemical engineering department iit kharagpur she was bestowed with prestigious rafi ahmed it way award punjab rao deshmukh outstanding women scientist award louis pasteur recognition award best teacher women bio scientist and fellow of different esteemed societies and academy her significant contributions comprises of cost effective industrial enzymes production using agro residues with immense applications in food and bio diesel, biofuel industries professor banerji has established a novel 2g ethanol technology with a bio refinery concept which harmonizing circu- uh, circular economy through her innovative research she has been granted with three international eight national patents of which 10 technologies have been transferred to different industries and agriculture stakeholders professor banerji guided 34 phds published 199 articles 49 book chapters authored and edited a book entitled environmental biotechnology oxford university press and omics based approaches in plant biotechnology will a cyber publishers so uh, uh, ma'am uh, on behalf of gurukul kangre vishwavidyalay i welcome you here in this five day fdp on uh, alternate fuels biofuels uh, ma'am uh, uh, the session is over to you welcome ma'am please uh, make us aware uh, with your deliberations uh, and uh, please ma'am the session is over to you ma'am the mic is on mute mode please unmute your mic but uh, here uh, no mic nothing is coming can you hear me yeah, you are you are audible now 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 is it uh, am i audible to you yeah yeah i yeah, am you are audible okay okay so uh, the yes, thing okay. is that i i want to yes i want to tell something to you that uh, you see uh, here the participant who are attending this uh, particular webinar all are teachers and uh, are teachers. i think yes uh, my namaskar to all of you so i'm ritu banerjee and presently i'm taking and uh, acting as head of the department of agricultural as well as uh, rural and uh, innovative technology to one big department and one center at iit kharagpur so uh, what i'm telling uh, uh, to you all is that why you have given two lectures in a single day because uh, see here this duration of the talk is one and a half hours and then half an hour gap and in continuously one and half hours i didn't notice because i i was so busy uh, i i could not notice but uh, i don't have that much of capability to uh, go for such a 3 hours 4 hours continuous talk uh, so can can this be uh, rearranged or can this be be uh, managed some somehow because uh, that uh, okay one one and half hour okay fine uh, 
But uh, after half an hour, if you, uh, you are asking me to go for another one and a half hour, then it is it is too much for me. Uh, so it 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 will be badly affecting the quality of talk. So that is the reason why I was thinking that yes, I will be uh, talking to you regarding this. But uh, yesterday after nine thirty or ten o'clock, I might uh, wait that that uh, other meetings were going on. So I could not get time. It was so late in the evening. So I thought of telling you before I start uh, my lecture. So that uh, it is uh, very uh, that frag end. So can this be rearranged? So that is my. Uh, please, you please continue with your first lecture. Then after that, we'll uh, share the uh, next schedule. You please okay. continue your first lecture. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. So that is the reason uh, why I'm just telling that, yes, uh, that can be done, then nothing better than this. So uh, this uh, this was my uh, request to Mr. Lumber or Dr. Lumber. So uh, with this uh, request, let me start the second generation ethanol production. So before I start the second generation ethanol production, uh, I think uh, let me start with the background that uh, why it is so important. So if we see the, the different sectors of our society, then I, can, can, you, can you mute? Uh, can you mute, please? Because some sounds are coming. Can you mute? Yes. So, starting from transport sector to socio-economic sector to value addition, GDP, energy, intensity and emissions, urbanization, electricity and its requirement. So, these these particular segments are overlapping. That is very much dependent to each other. When we are talking about the overall development, we talk about the energy. We see the energy utilization. And that way we are telling that how developed we are. How much is the energy uh, requirement and that is driven driven process for the urbanization and that is also directly linked with the transportation and these are very different very much uh, dependent on each other which is indicating the overall development of our society now if this is the truth then uh, let us uh, have a very clear picture that what is the energy need and what is bioenergy and that is very very important as far as the total globalization or the energy requirement is there so if we see the energy requirement then we can find that we have the traditional practices of utilizing the fossil fuel but with the gradual depletion of the fossil fuel, it is Hello, some echoes are coming. Hello? Yes. So when we are just talking about the utilization of fossil fuel, then we can find that this fossil fuel is gradually getting depleted. So with the depletion, with, with, that is the alarming uh, situation of the present civilized society. And that is the major concern of us that why we are going for the alternative energy sources and when we are talking about the alternative energy sources we definitely we are very much biased on the bio system biological resources which are renewable in nature and that that has got the sustainable pattern of production and that can be reliable on this at the same time, when we are 
talking about the the urbanization and utilize and development what we are seeing we are seeing that how much i in my first slide i told that how much energy is uh, utilized that is one of the parameter second parameter is how the transportation is more and more vehicle and more and more uh, this um, uh, the, the transportation sectors are getting uh, that facilities are existing we call it that very developed or it is developing or it is developed uh, state or cities or like that so when these transportations are running it is also releasing some emissions we are till now were ignorant about the emission part which is playing a significant role and that may be the reason why we are talking about only the development development and development we totally ignore the ecological system and environmental uh, pollution so when we are now talking addressing that the environment and ecosystem we definitely uh, are very much concerned about the atmospheric carbon dioxide level which is getting generated and that is that emission if we see that in this picture you can see there is a continuous increase in that emission of carbon dioxide and this is the alarming situation which is leading for the uh, that uh, global warming and that is the major concern of our present society and we are very much uh, very much uh, worried about this type of uh, releases which are there for this present uh, environmental uh, scenario so when this global warming is taking place, if we see the difference between 1880 and 2016, and we are now 2020. So if we see, then you can find that, that carbon dioxide, which is getting released, that this is the white line. You see, this is continuously getting accumulated, 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 and it is now in between 400 and 420 ppm and this is the precipitation this precipitation has been reduced drastically with the uh, with with this pandemic which come and we are now restricted our travel and that has got a very positive impact on the society what is happening you know when this particular carbon dioxide is getting released along with this carbon dioxide there are very toxic other uh, gaseous products are also coming and getting accumulated like carbon monoxide and other gases which are detrimental which are toxic to our health and that is the scenario and i will be talking all those in in my other lecture so if we see the bioethanol scenario then we can find that this bioethanol scenario is gradually is the trade which is gradually and depending upon the uh, the developed and developing country you can find that this different bio form of energy is gradually getting increased so these are the different uh, forms of energy which we generally use so starting from coal petroleum biomass natural gas hydroelectricity nuclear energy and other renewable resources uh, other uh, source of energy so if we consider then we can find that yes this is the uh, this bioenergy this biomass to bioenergy is playing a significant role in this bioenergy research and that may be the reason why people are going inclined towards the bioenergy and bio biomass utilization form. 
So if we see that this is the scenario of 2030. So if we see this 2030 scenario, then you can find that there is a strong acceleration which is needed between the today's present uh, situation and if we predict the situation by 2030. And here, different forms of energies have been given. So how much is the industry uh, industry requirement? How much energy we spend in transport? How much is the electricity? And how much is the other form of? So that includes the all other forms of energy. So if we see, see, this is not a very, very old data. If we see that 2015 data and 2030, we are now 2020. So if we see this 2015 and 2030 data, then we can find that that this is the, the uh, this uh, green one is the transportation sector. So I am just uh, showing you this particular uh, um, uh, sector which has got a very direct impact on this and other forms are also there but i'm not talking just i'm giving the transportation sector where we can see a very clear uh, picture of you see enhancement the transportation requirement it is in 2050 and the 2030 requirement that means earlier we used to have one car but now the people, although we are telling that, yes, uh, we are below poverty and we don't have uh, this, uh, uh, our uh, food for uh, survive, but the prediction, the actual uh, this uh, uh, data is showing that the, uh, the reality is something different. So, if we see the transportation requirement in 2050 is some amount and that is getting magnified, that requirement got enhanced by three times, by three times. And when the survey has been taken place in the urban uh, cities, it has been seen that four people are staying in the house and four vehicles are there and sometimes we have also seen that two people are staying and 10 or 12 vehicles are there so this is the way of living and this is the lifestyle of the urban people the rich people they never use the or they never share their own vehicle and they have their own. So uh, parents and two children, so four vehicles are there. So nobody is having that uh, sharing attitude or our lifestyle I'm telling that is what changed. As a result, what is happening, the requirement is getting enhanced by three times, which is an alarming situation as far as the uh, requirement or the need of the demand is concerned. So this is the predicted demand, which is enormously getting increased, increased and increased. And that is the point of the coordinates. So I'm just telling you the background. If you understand the background, then only it will be very, very easy for you to understand the need for this research work, why it is so important and why government is giving so much pressure to, to, to uh, go for this alternative uh, fuel generation and why it is so important. Compared to this transport, if we see the other sectors, you see still the requirement is just double, just 20, 2050 to 2030. Only 15 years the demand is showing. And if you see the, the trend, it is continuously getting enhanced. And that is the reason why we are 
pretty much going into bioenergy research. So when we are talking about the global ethanol production, so why is, so when we are talking about this transportation sector, we talk about, we are showing our urinates towards the petroleum products. So petrol and diesel, this is the transportation field. So we want to go for the transportation of this, uh, the, uh, for the alternate production of this particular or substitute for the petroleum. What is the uh, substitute for the petroleum product is the ethanol. So what government is uh, thinking of, they are thinking that if ethanol is getting produced, they will be going for the blending of this ethanol with a different ratio to actual petroleum product. So when this petrol is 95% and uh, ethanol is 5%, so we are calling it that it is the 5% blending. When 90% petrol, 10% ethanol, that is 10% blending. And that way, government has gone up to 20% blending program. And when the demand, what I was showing, that 2015 and 2030, if we see the demand of this particular uh, petroleum substitute, then we can find that the the actual liter which is needed to meet this particular high amount of demand is in the tune of billions and billions a liter of ethanol. So this is the alarming situation. So this global ethanol production project is automatically getting attention to everybody. So what this uh, this uh, demand is telling it is in the form of 114 billion liter requirement which was predicted in the year 2014 and this demand is going to be increased to 135 liter by the end of 2025. So this is the requirement prediction which is an alarming situation. The two major ethanol producers are the two states, of one is the United States and Brazil. So other European countries and uh, Republic of China and uh, those people who are there, they are also going for this particular uh, ethanol production processes, but here, this United States and Brazil, they are producing this ethanol from sugarcane. So Indians, in India, the Indians, particularly the West Bengal people like us, so we are very much fond of sweets. And if we find that a sweet, that sugar is being used for ethanol production, and there is no availability of uh, it, uh, sweets, the sugar for the sweet preparation, obviously we will not be very happy because we like, that means here the contradiction is coming into the picture, what is called food versus fuel for this uh, uh, conflict. And this conflict is also very important because it is not like West Bengal. There are many people in this uh, country who are very much liking sweets. So if we utilize this sugarcane for ethanol production, obviously this is not a viable solution for ethanol production. So if this is the truth, then how to address? Because requirement is a very high. 35 billion liters. So if 135 billion liters requirement is there, how we will be producing? So today, if I go for this uh, particular biomass, some people will be telling we are not happy. So if we go, we, we select some other raw material, some other people from other part of the country will be telling we are not happy. So how to satisfy everybody is a major concern of our scientific community. And thus, what the alternative has been 
thought of is the lignocellulose mass. Now, when we are talking about the lignocellulose mass, as I have now told you, the other uh, societal part of who are there, they started fighting with each other. No, 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 we are not happy. We are not happy. What happened? No, uh, we are, uh, this, uh, how, how cattle will be getting uh, the, the, their grass and all. So if we utilize all lignocellulosics for ethanol production, that means what I was talking, food versus fuel. And now after this particular incident, it is up that food feed versus fuel. So these issues came into the picture. Now, when these issues came into the picture, then only that next, uh, this supply demand and all those things have come into the consideration. So, see here, I was talking about 5%, 10%, 15%, and 20%. You just see the demand is continuously getting increased, increased, and increased. So here, if we see, the ethanol and the diesel blending, the both the picture, you will be finding that there the increase that with the percentage of blending ratio, the demand is gradually, it is also increasing in the logarithmic pattern. So this is the uh, situation of our uh, present uh, global situation and now the major questions come to the scientists is that how to address this how we can go for the this uh, this, uh, this particular problem uh, solution so how to get the solution from this uh, for this particular problem so now let us see that at a glance that and in which way we are going for the classification of these bioresources. So these bioresources are, can be majorly divided into direct value and indirect value. So when we are going for this direct value, we are talking about the uh, energy, medicine, and some other uh, activities of the human being. And the major utilization is in the form of food. Where indirect values are considered, we are considering ecosystem. And we talk about seed dispersal, carbon cycle, and so on. So when we are just talking about the primary demand, so I was talking about the inter world and how the people are going in this world. So now if we see country-wise, that how this particular country, why is that the demand is there? So first is China. China's demand is the top, it occupies the topmost position, followed by European country, uh, no, followed by U United States, then European countries, then India, and then the other uh, countries of which who are there. So if we see the demand is so high, how Chinese are producing? So I don't know how much respect you have on Chinese research because China, and they are very hardworking and they are doing their research day and night and they are going ahead with anybody else. They are working uh, I think 16, 17 hours per day, not like Indians. So uh, Indians are uh, not that effective and they, they are not that much dedicated like Chinese. So if you see the world's, total world's energy supply pattern, we can find that the this is the uh, information which we, uh, I have taken from EIA. And so here the coal is contributes 27.9%, natural gas contributes 22.2%, and conventional energy 
that occupies 31.1 percent and some other hydro wind solar geothermal and this occupies the rest of them so when we are just going for this prediction this is the uh, 2012 energy supply scenario and fragmented from this and when we are seeing the predicted the coal utilization is not reduced so 20 in 2035 the coal sources will be utilized from 27.9 to 27.2 percent whereas the conventional one has been reduced to 31.3 percent to 26.8 percent natural gases 22.2 to 22.7 percent but you see the the other forms of energy here the solar energy hydro energy wind energy and the geothermal these particular things are getting increased in this particular uh, prediction and this currently 85 million barrels of crude oils are processed and they are used to meet the energy which is needed in to meet the global demand but the demand for crude oil which are projected to increase from 116 million, million, million barrel by 2030. So this is the very, very important and worried data. So if this is so, we are very much interested to see the prediction from year-wise 2013 to 2023. So we are here. So within three years, you see there is a clean increase which is showing and the renewable biojet this is and the conventional ethanol is gradually getting increased in this particular prediction so what we are talking about is the truth of today that means what is needed is to address to produce this particular ethanol production which is needed for to, to meet this so how we can go for this so i have already mentioned you about the different forms of this energy so when we are talking about continuously i'm talking let me have some more. So, do you have any question? So, one part I have already completed, and that is the scenario which I have already talked. Is there any question? No, no ma'am. Please continue. Okay. Please continue. Yes. Okay. So, if not, then let me come to the other part. So, other part is that. So, that is the energy part and what is our lifestyle and how we are just utilizing this uh, particular uh, um, uh, this uh, um, addressing what is the demand and how uh, it can be there how the demand is gradually getting increased so these are the uh, requirement which we have understood now coming to the next part of our uh, ethanol production or ethanol processes bioethanol production processes so when we are talking about this bioethanol production processes so what i'm talking about the raw material which is very very important now when we are talk uh, we, we talk about the uh, ethanol production we know that ethanol is getting produced by Saccharomyces or in yeast under anaerobic condition, which where this sugar is getting converted to ethanol. So this is the simple concept of general paper. But in case 
the simple sugar is there so this sugar can be of different forms so in case of uh, uh, the sources of this sugar we can see that we are blessed with the god's blessings that sugar cane has plenty of sugar sources sweet beets are there sorghums are there and when we are processing the cow milk the cheese whey is also there which can also be processed for the sugar recovery so the country like brazil india they are very much uh, interested for sugar cane the sugar beet is mainly the european countries sugar sorghum solely that indians are there and now many other countries are also there uh, producing but these are the uh, different type uh, types of raw material which are having the plenty of symptoms if we go for little different raw material selection then we can find that corn is another uh, raw material which is also having a plenty of the starchy material we need we have also the wheat we have also the cassava which are having the lot of starchy material within it and this starch material this starchy material can be processed for ethanol production and this corn to ethanol is already uh, commercialized and practiced in united states china and canada in case of wheat we are just going for this canada china and european country and from cassava to ethanol this starchy material is practiced in thailand so these are some of the countries who are already commercializing by utilizing this type of sources which are already already there so they, they undergo the different uh, unit operations like milling infection sacrification fermentation of this particular sugar or ethanol generation now in india what should we do we are very much interested for uh, we are not very much interested to utilize this sugar cane or cassava or corn or wheat for ethanol production because we are thickly dense populated country and our primary requirement is food and then only other aspects are coming into the picture so what we are doing we are just going for the potential resources of biomass selection so what we are doing we are just going for the lignocellulosic and its classification so when we are going for the lignocellulosic so we talk about the agricultural residues and that agricultural residues include wheat straw corn stubbles and then energy crops like sweet grass is popular and then we are going for this food and paper waste and then municipality solid waste so that way we characterize the lignocellulosics in india so there are different types of classification so when this is the general classification what we are doing then based on the grazability so what i was talking earlier that food feed versus fuel so when we talk about the food feed versus fuel then obviously we talk about the grazing raw material and non grazing raw material so grazing raw material means it is it can be utilized for feed production so like rice straw wheat straw wheat straw uh, rice husk jute waste and so many other oil seed crops and waste which can be in, utilized or used for edible purpose for the cattle or the other animals so which are there some products are still there in our country and it is getting produced in bulk say for example i'm just talking about castor oil. so when we are talking about this castor oil then uh, if you see the world's stand 
India's position, then world ranking, then we can find that castor oil production, in castor oil production, India's position is number four. So we are producing the castor oil in huge quantity. What is happening to the plant? Because castor oil is, I, I don't know whether you have seen or not, that food is having the, uh, the, the oil content. And once the food is harvested, the fruit is taken by the company for oil uh, production. What is happening to the lignocellulosic biomass? It is un either getting burned or buried under the soil because this particular raw material is non-grazing in nature because of the presence of some toxin within it. And for resinous communities, we are telling this as ricin toxin. And because of this presence of this toxin, either to leaf or to stem, this is making this particular biomass non-edible in nature. Similarly, lantana camera. Lantana camera has also lented in toxins, which are there and in A, B, C, D, so different forms of these toxins are there in different parts of the uh, plant. And that is making this particular lantana camera as non-edible in nature. Jetropha, Jetropha, I think you know that for, for biodiesel, it was a big project. And this Jetropha fruits, after taking this, many that, that leaves and other parts of this particular thing is not uh, having any any use because here the formal toxins are there. So these are some of the uh, things which are naturally present in that particular lignocellulosics which is making that lignocellulosics non edible in it. So when we are talking about this type of raw material, these raw materials are plenty available in the uh, in our country, and some some of the uh, products are going. We are producing it under contract farming, but for a particular purpose. So once the fruit is getting uh, isolated, that fruit is uh, harvested. Plant is a problem. So either they are getting burned. So once it is getting burned, so huge quantity of fumes and this, uh, uh, this air pollution, pollutants are getting generated. So this type of, and some of the raw materials are naturally having some disadvantages, some bottlenecks. Say, for example, if we talk about pineapple leaf waste, so this pineapple leaf has got very sharp and this some some uh, some uh, uh, very fine nature. And if the cattle they want to chew this, their tongue is getting cut. So they don't take this. Bamboo sa bamboo. One of the variety is that uh, is called bushy bamboos. So other form of bam bamboos. I don't know whether how many how much many of you are working with this bamboo. There are more than 72 different species of bamboo uh, trees are available in India. And one variety is called bushy bamboo. And this bushy bamboo is not having the stick, which has got commercial uh, value. But this bushy, uh, this bushy bamboo is not chewable. And that is why it is not visible. And that is that that are some of the disadvantages of this non-grazing lignocellulosis. But again, the scientists they have seen the biochemical composition, the percentage of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin present in this raw material. They have seen that this whether it is grazing or non-grazing, it is having a very high percentage of the, um, it is having a very high percentage of cellulosic material. That means that cellulose and hemicellulose are present in a very good amount. 
so that is the reason why people are very much concerned about burning of these or buried when they are getting buried under the soil that is the major concern of the scientists that this particular product can be used for different purposes so when i'm talking about this lignocellulosic now let us come to the actual biochemistry of this particular molecule so when we are going for this biochemistry of this molecule then we can find that this lignin is a part which is tremendously robust in nature and it is giving the mechanical strength to the particular plant whereas the cellulosic uh, cellulosics which are there that is in the form of cellulose and hemicellulose they they are the uh, the unique sugars which are present and this sugar can be utilized which are naturally present in that particular biomass and that can be used for different purposes so when we just talking about this different form of the sugars and all then we can find that yes the sugars can be of different type pentose and hexose and they can be of uh, other other forms that is in cellulose it is only having the it is only having the uh, the uh, it is it is only having the hexo sugars but in case of hemicellulose the it is a mixture of pentose as well as hexose so i will be coming to those classification in the latter part but when this lignin is there the lignin is the robust biomolecule which are there and it is playing a very very tough role and making the scientists to cry but it is very very difficult to address or hydrolyze so when we are talking about the pure versus mixed lignocellulose biomass we are just talking about the storage storageability and feedstock local feedstock seasonal and dependence of this and we are talking about the biochemical composition of this particular mixture and in which ratio we can go for this mixture for uh, biochemical analysis so when we are just classifying the lignocellulose biomass on an average this lignocellulose biomass can be of hardwood softwood and grasses it can be edible and non edible and it can be the warm seasonal biomass cold seasonal biomass and perennial perennial biomass so when i'm talking of type 1 we can find in haridwar you will be seeing this type of uh, biomasses which are otherwise the hardwood trees this is the leaves and it is deciduous in nature they are anthospermic and use flowers to pollinate and there are different types of examples which are there and here some of this uh, commercially woody biomass is important in terms of higher potential for bioethanol production and the cost is effectively for used for the transportation and production center but the others uh, they have the marketable and interesting uh, this terms for this uh, uh, uses and they can also be used for this bioethanol production i think in haridwar you have plenty pine trees and that pine tree tips which are there and it is produced in a few of tons and tons and that pine uh, tips which are there that uh, that can be utilized for ethanol production that is a potential raw material for ethanol production so these are the soft wood trees which are there and they can also be and it includes uh, that pines and cedars etc so these are some of the examples i'm just telling and coming to the other varieties these varieties include the different types of grasses 
and these grasses are uh, are also produced in a huge quantity but the things are that in this country is one bamboo bamboo is there sugar cane is there sweet grass is there so different types of grasses are the niper niper uh, leaves are there king niper uh, leaves are there banana leaves are there pineapple uh, are some of these so they they are there are different types of grasses which are there that belongs to either c3 or c4 plants so these are very very important characterization of the uh, particular biomass as far as this production is concerned so when we are talking about this biomass and its production productivity i'm just talking about the indian grasses in some other uh, plenty our country is very much rich with the biodiversity and each and every lignocellulose which has got the plenty of cellulose very cellulose can be utilized can be considered for bioethanol production so these are some of the examples for type 1 type 2 and three. so you see that it is non edible what i have to is add some of the examples of this continuously i'm talking so when i'm just uh, uh, doing this classification of lignocellulose then other group of scientists were very much interested to go for the uh, the the residual after processing of the, uh, grains or some some food producing uh, plants they have seen that that rice straw after rice paddy is getting harvested then they found that rice straw and rice husk is the major by product of that particular wheat straw is there jahar straw is there bajra is there maize is there and different raw materials are uh, available which produce a huge quantity of biomass after processing of the particular lignocellulose so that is also this bulk production of this type of raw material so they added up with this raw lignocellulose which i have talked till now they thought that if this can be uh, added up with this particular uh, raw material then how it can be utilized and how it can be used for subsequent use so when this type of products were getting uh, this uh, generated they found that there is a sustainability in the production pattern so when the biomass is getting produced and there is a sustainability uh, of this particular biomass then that biomass can be considered for any product process development so that is why this particular residual after pre processing this residues uh, were also considered for bioethanol production now the third con uh, uh, concern which has come to the notice of the scientists is the market price of this that how costly will be this ethanol when we are going for this ethanol production now uh, i think uh, you must have heard of uh, the present scenario which is uh, getting uh, which is presently getting tracked in delhi and punjab haryana and that way that uh, after rice is getting uh, I, hello and rice is getting harvested then uh, that parali uh, or parali uh, something uh, in hindi it is called uh, parali jalana and uh, that is the residual yes 
हेलो पराली मैम पराली पराली यस पराली इज वन ऑफ द वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इशू which has come into the notice of this uh, particular scientific community and it was a concern for the common people even that uh, yes uh, if it is get burned then what is actually happening to the environment so why it will be getting burned so it is lignocellulosic no doubt about this uh, we have already established that yes this is the lignocellulosic which is getting uh, which which have a plenty of cellulosic molecule that can be utilized scientifically for ethanol generation now how the selection of this raw material should will be uh, produced now see i am in the eastern part of india i am in uh, very very uh, far from uh, this uh, the raw material which is available in himalayan uh, region if somebody is thinking by sitting in the northern part of india like you people that i will be utilizing the raw material which is getting produced in kanyakumari and it is my wish so i want to do that so that type of madi thinking will not at all helping you so what is to be done is that we have to have a very clear idea that what raw material is available in my region what raw material is there plenty available in a cheaper cost because the ethanol which will be getting added to petroleum product how much is the uh, petrol product 1 liter petrol it is maximum 75 to 80 rupees and not more than that now if you think of bringing your raw material from kanyakumari to haridwar and and you want to produce that you just imagine the transportation charge so transport transportation charge will be more than 100 and then you will be taking that raw material and going for the processing it will also add up the cost and when it will be coming your product will be into the existence then that product will be costing as 200 rupees 300 rupees per liter who will buy your product so the scientists so what they started thinking that yes our uh, so if suppose this is the origin if here is the production and if we are just going for the transportation so what raw material is to be considered by product generation so that analysis was market survey or pricing analysis have already been done so what they have done they, they did is that that origin where the product lignocellulosic is getting produced and they have taken 100 km periphery they have taken 50 km periphery and they did the survey and when while doing the survey it has been seen that if it is 50 km from the particular uh, point of uh, production and if it is 100 km from the point of production then the cost of transportation is also very very important factor which is playing a significant role on the overall profitability of the product for me and they found that 40 dollar for 100 km periphery transportation 40 dollar is contributed for 1 ton of biomass uh, transport so this is the added cost and that may be the reason every time this is my recommendation to government of india everywhere i am shouting that there should be a decentralized process product development thing it is not like a your steel factory or steel industry where a big industry is getting set up it should be decentralized and depending upon the availability of the raw material one should go for bioethanol production where 
and this should be very near to the origin of the biomass which is getting produced and when this biomass production is taking place and it is not far from this particular uh, origin then transportation cost will be minimum transportation cost will be minimum your overall production productivity will be getting in a lower price so you can make good profit and make the process viable and when it then it is origin that means our country is a cultivated country so lignocellulosic biomass means where the production is there where production is there it is in a village where uh, it is the plenty availability is there where i'm recommending for this particular plant setup it is the rural based product so when the rural based production unit is getting uh, set up so obviously the rural folk will be getting involved and they will be getting job for that particular activities and the atmanirbhar bharat will be automatically getting addressed with this type of product process development and that is the reason why we are talking about this type of decentralized decentralized rural based process product establishment here i'm just trying to show you the importance of this particular global warming so when this parali is getting burnt in the village in the field you see there is lot of this soil soil whatever flora fauna is there whatever beneficial bacteria is there they are all are getting killed your earthworm is getting killed loss of carbon is there loss of biodiversity is there health hazard and human system is there because of the fume and foam so there when this release of soot and particles which are there there that they release that smoke and that emission includes the greenhouse gas emission overall it is participating in the uh, overall global warming process now if i quantify that if i burn one ton not much if i burn one ton of rice straw parali in the field 199 kg of particulate matter is getting 1460 kg of carbon dioxide is getting released to the environment 60 kg of carbon monoxide is getting released 2 kg of sulfur dioxide is getting released and 3 kg of particulate matter is getting released to the environment just you just imagine and we are we are burning hundreds and thousands and thousands tons of this parali in the village so you just imagine the amount of these pollutants which are getting released and accumulated in the atmosphere so once it is getting released in the atmosphere so we can have a tremendous health hazard and people are suffering from lung diseases to anything and everything so until and unless you have a good health you cannot do any healthy body is not there healthy thinking will not be coming in the picture so this is the major concern and that may be the reason why this is the this is coming into the picture when we talk about the particular uh, environment and technology how we can go for the addressing the process product development with the eco friendly and environment green based technology development with this very small background 
I'm just talking about now coming to the biofuel. Now, when we are talking about this biofuel, we divide the biofuel into liquid fuel and gaseous fuel. So, liquid fuel includes ethanol, diesel, and biobutanol, and gaseous fuel includes biomethane, biohydrogen, and gas, biohydrogen, and so, so many things. So, you can now understand from my talk that how how one can go for this particular uh, this this solution when the present scenario is in this imbalanced condition if this is the demand demand is in the tube of an elephant the production unit in our country is can be compared as an ant so if this is and that too a single ant so this is the present scenario condition so this is the present condition and this is the demand so there is a huge gap between supply we have to now address this particular issue now coming to this lignocellulosic balance So when we are going for this lignocellulosic biomass, that lignin, cellulose, and hemicellulose are there. So I have already told you that lignin is a very, very strong biomolecule, whereas cellulose and hemicellulose, so which are there, are a very, very soft and targeted that can be considered for this process. Just one. Hello. I'm 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 Hey, I'm sorry. this is the problem uh, so they are calling me for some meeting is <laughs> so that is why uh, i have to go okay so this is the lignocellulosic biomass so lignin hemicellulose and cellulose are there so uh, here uh, when we are just talking about the first generation second generation third generation and fourth generation biofuel production we talk about this first generation bioethanol means the sugar cane that juice can be directly uh, utilized for bioethanol production so when the food grains and all the starchy based materials are used for ethanol generation so we consider those as first generation Second generation is a little tough where we are considering some lignocellulose biomasses and for ethanol production for which I have till now discussed in details about the second generation biomass and their temperature. Third generation biomass is the alkyl based product where this algae is being utilized for biomass generation and fourth generation is otherwise known as the uh, the molecular biology that the genetic engineer genetic, genetically engineered uh, feedstock or microorganisms which are generally used for the ethanol production so when we are just talking about the uh, these challenges in this particular second generation ethanol production so we find that 
the maximum lignin degradation with minimum losses of cellulose and polycellulose are the biggest challenge because lignin is has made the bonding with the other biomolecules in such a way while degrading this lignin some of the other cellulosic molecules are also getting lost along with this so if we lose a single molecule of carbohydrate moieties it is a loss of ethanol for ethanol production and then we are just going for the efficient deployment uh, de depolymerization of lignin without the production of furfural and hydroxymethyl furfural what is the present practice we are going for the physical chemical physical chemical and biological processes and when we are going for the physical and chemical processes along with the physical chemical processes we use different types of devices like size reduction micro wave irradiation acid alkali and some other toxic chemicals uses hot water steam explosion sound ultrasound weight oxidation ammonia recycling and that supercritical uh, carbon dioxide uh, that uh, which can be used for this removal of this robust biomolecule that is the lignin and when we go for this of robust biomolecule uh, preparation that uh, uh, removal what is happening it is removed it is we are successfully removing that but along with that some toxic intermediates are getting produced in the form of furfural and hydroxymethyl furfural and this hydro uh, this hmf and h this uh, furfural and hydroxymethyl furfural are acting as an inhibitor for bioethanol generation and then the losses of hexose pentose sugars are there and this loss of uh, less tolerance of the yeast for ethanol production because ethanol we are just uh, um, using as antimicrobial agent and when we are just using it as antimicrobial agent what we are thinking we are we are uh, how we are thinking that ethanol will, can withstand very high amount of this as a result what is happening when ethanol concentration is little high in that particular environment then the particular microorganisms are getting killed that yeast is getting killed at productivity there is a sharp decrease in the productivity so these are the different physical treatments and details of this physical and chemical and physical chemical treatments are there which are generally practiced in uh, in in the industry for removal of lignin in the from the lignocellulosic biomass but at present in iit we are going for the biological processing of lignin this biological pretreatment of lignin is the modern uh, application of lignin where we are uh, applying it for the removal of the lignin in a scientific manner by the release of the enzyme which is called ligninase lacase is one of the part of this ligninase so what we are uh, we have seen this lacase can be of three types one is called blue lacase yellow lacase and white lacase so if we see the mechanism of action of this particular uh, enzymes then we can find that some are independently working on that but some needs mediator for this degradation process so when we are talking about this uh, sources of lacase we talk about this different sources like fungus bacteria some plants and some insect say for example some of the insect in their in their uh, stomach that this type of uh, enzymes are plenty available and we are just going for this particular 
uh, enzyme isolation and harvesting. So when we are just adopting the strategies for lignocellulosic bioethanol production, what we have seen is that there are plenty of lignocellulosic biomasses. We are just going for this processing with the enzymes. And in this process, what we have noticed is that the water requirement with this that compared to acid and alkali because when you are uh, using acid you have to neutralize it you have to add some other chemicals and then you have to neutralize and then you have to go for the washing so this washing takes a huge quantity of water which is not needed for this enzymatic processing of this particular biomass. And here what we have seen that as there is no uh, additional chemicals are being used, so water which is getting generated can be very easily recycled back to the process. So this way, what we have seen is that as there is no toxic perfural hydroxymethyl perfumals are produced, and a low energy driven process is there that with the minimum with the um, minimum effort with the low severity the production is getting very high that this is the condition this particular uh, process so once we are talking about the chemical processes along with the enzymatic process so what we have seen is that one, if you can go for low severity and then you you uh, may not be taking care of other parts, so you'll be getting that low fermentation of the yield. If you are going for the this uh, low severity and fermentation yield, both are uh, getting increased in case of no severity process. But in some cases, it is high severity that solid are there is getting hydrolyzed and fermentation yield is getting low because of the amount of byproducts of complex reaction uh, formation the yield of the process is getting compromised so that is the reason we have to it is we who have to select that in which process or what process are to be adopted for no severity, high severity, or no severity. So we have opted for the no severity process where no toxics, uh, toxic middle intermediates are getting produced in this particular process. So that is the reason why we are very much interested to go for this particular lignocellulosic uh, material at Kharagpur in our laboratory. We are working with different types of raw material like business communities, lantern camera, cans, grass, sugarcane uh, tops, sugarcane bagas, sugarcane uh, uh, this peat and uh, molasses and so on. And different parts of this uh, sugarcane, wheat straw, sweet sorghum, banana plant, pineapple waste, uh, bambusa bamboo and rice straw. So we are working with the different uh, uh, raw materials and we have also come for the mixture of raw materials which are there. So this is the laboratory where we we have established our pilot plant facilities at IIT Kharagpur and this is the uh, premises, lab premises uh, where we are going for the enzymatic venture for 2G ethanol production. And here in this particular uh, process we have gone for the standard process standardization for uh, two different uh, um, uh, this, uh, uh, processes we have established. One is with blue lackeys, another is with yellow lackeys, and plenty of uh, my, more than I think 14, 15 students they have completed their PhDs on this, and we have established the technology for enzyme mediated delignification which are getting uh, standardized with the particular process. So here, what we have seen is that as the process is complete, getting completed under mild condition, 
the yield of ethanol is very, very high. And that is the reason we have uh, published plenty of papers on this and we have gone for the different types of uh, analysis that we Live straw, lantern, camera, resinous, communities, mamusa, bamboo, calcas, pineapple waste, and their different compositional vari variation that how much is the lignins and loses and things in the loses. So, after delignification, as this is the enzymatic process, so I had to undergo uh, different types of questions. So, whether the actual delignification has taken place or not. And then these are the sum of the it's the same picture that yes we have seen but uh, then the scientific community they were very much uh, questioning that uh, what are the structural changes so then we have gone for FTIR and we have gone for the XRD and we have shown them that yes the crystallinity index of that particular uh, uh, cellulosic molecules are getting changed and with the different types of raw material we have gone for different types of the taste and we have uh, seen the different fermentation processes also and where we have gone for the different the simultaneous sacrification and fermentation the separate hydrolysis and fermentation consolidated bioprocessing partial consolidated bioprocessing and the simultaneous uh, sacrification and fermentation and we have gone up to 8% ethanol production in case of trans class. And we have also gone for the pilot plant studies. These are some of the tests for this pilot plant. And this is the pilot plant unit operations. And uh, we have gone for the different uh, systems for the pilot plant studies in large quantity. And here I have established, this is the pilot plant which I have established at IIT Kharagpur in the Kisina Center. Here we can process 550 kgs of biomass for a single batch operation. And we have established the process where we can go for the entire processing of lignocellulosics that is getting completed within 24 hours of time. And this is the process which is unique in the world and nobody has this type of efficient process where within 24 hours the entire processing will be getting completed. These are some of the unit operations of that particular pilot plant. Then what is happening? You see this uh, ethanol is a liquid product. The solid which are getting accumulated is further getting processed and we have gone for this is the from pilot plant this methane is getting burned so we are we are producing the methane for this uh, from this uh, solid residue which is left over and then the after methane is getting generated the leftover residue is further getting fortified and we are going for the biofertilizer or biomanure uh, generation and here also one PhD student has completed her studies on biomanure of, from this low cellulosics and she has gone for this, uh, different applications and with the different composition uh, in, in different types of soil. And uh, we have seen that we go for, we can now in a position to recommend the, uh, the, the amount of uh, biomanure which are to be applied for this uh, bio uh, for, for organic cultivation. So this is the overall process. So here we are going for the different types of the bio, uh, uh, this is the enzyme production, these are the polyroom complex. And from here, first we are getting the biomass and uh, from here we are getting the enzyme. And this enzyme and the biomass is they are getting pre-processed and it is coming to the reactor and we are going for the fermentation. After fermentation and enzymatic production, the liquid is getting further processed and we are getting the liquid fuel for uh, bioethanol production, which can be used for the uh, petroleum substitute. And the solid, which is there, the solid is further getting anatomically digested and here, 
that methane which is getting produced is having a huge quantity of carbon dioxide and this carbon dioxide is getting scrapped and we are just taking this in the algal pond and we are uh, going for the oleogenous uh, microbes generation and from there the biomass that uh, oil bodies are getting separated for biodiesel production and the biomass is once again get, get, uh, coming back to this reactor for ethanol generation and here this diesel is which biodiesel which is getting produced is used for the fuel vehicle and the uh, methane after getting this methane which is getting uh, uh, this uh, uh, isolated from this biogas is further getting utilized for electricity generation and solid after the uh, anaerobic digestion is getting over the solid which is further uh, coming out of it is further fortified and going for biofertilizer application. So we have named this technology as soil to soil technology out of the as the outcome of this particular uh, project we have filed four different patents and this is the work that i have presented here so many students you can see that they are the, the, the those who are on the outer orbital they have completed their uh, degree that uh, phd degrees and now they are well settled in different universities and institutions some of them are in the abroad and